So let me just mention that the use of any trade or brand names or specific products just meant for information purposes. It's not approval from me nor from the university. And if I fail to mention something similar, it's not meant to be a disparagement of that product. So just understand it's just to help with communication. So our focus strategies to reduce pest and then some pest controls that we'd actually be doing throughout the season. So we'll talk about specific pests when they're happening, uh, when we're gonna be looking at uh, taking some sort of action to deal with those and even some products that we recommend to do that. So it is gonna have a heavy emphasis tonight on the use of pesticides. Um, and where possible, where we might have some organic options or alternatives, I will mention those. In large part, there's not a tremendous number of organic options. Um, and so that's not going to be uh, relevant, uh, re relevant or evident with every product. There's not automatically an alternative, but where there are, we'll kind of talk about it. So much of the talk tonight is going to be coming from the document you see on the left, the disease and insect control and home fruit plantings. And we will touch on both diseases and insect tonight. Pest is that big umbrella term that would cover both of those. We won't be touching on pests like squirrels or deer, though, uh, but certainly we'll be covering disease and insects. And so we're going to be walking through this publication somewhat. I'm not going to touch on every point there uh, or even every commodity that's listed there in detail. So if you have an orchard or uh, a vineyard or things like that that has more than just some of our major tree species, you'll still find great resources in there for your efforts. So why do we need to focus on pest control? So this is the first webinar of the year. Well, th the problem with growing fruit in our region is we live in a region that is very conducive for both insects and diseases. And so especially in the last few years where we've had some people retiring to the area, uh, experienced gardeners, they'll comment on how different this area is. Uh, our heat and humidity uh, can be very challenging with diseases. Insects, depending where you're coming from, we may have more generations of those insects, so they're around longer. Um, and, and the short answer is we focus on pest control with this first class because it's really needed. Um, and the challenge for us, too, is when we're talking about these pests, it's not only the plant as a whole that is attacked, but even the fruit. That part that we actually are harvesting can be attacked and damaged or rot on the tree before we even get the opportunity uh, to take advantage of it ourselves. So we have a lot of the wrong circumstances for success, so we want to kind of move the equation back to success, and that would be doing some sort of pest control. Sometimes I run into folks that do ask about, well, can I grow fruits without doing a pest control program? And really, when I say pest control, in large part, I do mean spraying some sort of pesticide products. Um, you can grow fruit without pesticides, but there's a few points that we have to be honest about. One of those, the quality of that fruit compared to a good control program is going to be much lower. So it's not going to look like those nice fruit that are in uh, a grocery store. They're going to be a little bit more ugly. There can very well be years that you don't have a harvest at all, depending on what crops we're talking about. And so, you know, again, if it's where you're counting on harvesting every single year, you're going to want a more rigorous control program. If this is just a hobby and if you're happy, if you get it one year and it's okay, if you don't the next, you may have a little more leeway or, or a little bit less rigid of a control program. And the truth is some fruits are more easily grown without an active spray program. Doesn't mean they're necessarily easy, but uh, you have greater likelihood of success with those. So uh, we'll try to touch on that as we go through this. So one thing that sometimes folks ask about, uh, and I mentioned this in the relationship to basically healthy, happy trees and plants are better able to resist our pest. And so fertilization, um, we can look at our trees and make a determination whether they need fertilization or not. A lot of backyard trees aren't cropped very heavy. Sometimes they're in the lawn or the landscape, which is already getting uh, fertilizer, and so they may be getting enough that way. But we can look at doing direct fertilization if we're not pleased with the growth we're getting. And so if we don't have a soil test available to us, we're only going to look at applying nitrogen. 
And so basically the first year when we plant trees, we're not so worried about actually fertilizing then, but in the second year and later, we would do a 10th of a pound of actual nitrogen for every year age, or if we're not sure on the age of a tree, if it's some somehow where we bought a property, we might look at per inch of, inch diameter of trunk. We're not gonna put a tremendous amount of nitrogen out there. We're maxing out uh, at six tenths of a pound. So just over half a pound. Actual nitrogen, you hear me using that phrase, that is actually based on the nitrogen content of a fertilizer. So if we have a hypothetical, and this is a hypothetical fertilizer, so don't go to the store and ask for it, but a 10, 11, 12 fertilizer, 10% is the nitrogen content. It's that first number on the bag. And so in a 10% product, that would mean one pound actually equals that one-tenth of a pound of actual nitrogen because 10% of that pound is nitrogen. And so there's been some changing thought on when we fertilize our fruit trees, particularly. Um, generally, I would say wait until they're fully leafed out. Uh, the idea is that we'll have less leaching then. Uh, if we do it too early in the season, used to, we would often see recommendations for late winter. And there's really been a thought to push that later. There's been some research that shows if we go till we see full leaf out on those trees, we actually have a little bit better uh, impact from that fertilizer because it's when maximum growth is kind of happening and the tree is better able to make use of it. So I would say wait till those trees are leafed out. And again, I've already said this, healthy plants are less likely to become infected with diseases and they are better able to resist insects. So certainly uh, we want to keep those trees happy. We can judge an acceptable growth on apple trees. If we're getting 18 inches of growth every year, um, we probably don't need to do much fertility on peaches and stone fruit. I'd probably say we'd be looking closer to 24 inches maybe. Um, but certainly if we're getting tremendous amounts of growth, we don't have to fertilize. So don't think it's something that you must do. We can actually look at the tree, see how vigorous it is and make that decision. Do you want to mention that when we talk about diseases and plants, um, there's basically three things that come together to make that happen. It's the pathogen, the environment, and the host. And so Anytime we can modify one of these to where it no longer supports that disease happening, it's great. Challenge with environment is, okay, we could maybe grow things in a high tunnel and change the environment, but realistically, it's not practical in the backyard. Pathogens, ideally, we'd love to grow in a pathogen-free environment, but the fact is we have things that get carried in on air currents or are brought in uh, in different ways with insects, so it's not likely that we can just completely remove pathogens from uh, our growing area. So one thing that we can do is actually look at host susceptibility. So if we have a host that is either um, resistant or even immune to a disease, uh, then that means we don't worry about that disease because it doesn't have the ability to infect that host. And so for me, I really focus on getting growers or uh, gardeners to look at what varieties are you planting? And so the number one thing we want to do to control pests is to start with the varieties that we are planting. We want to choose the most disease resistant ones possible and also ones that are suited to our area. So with tree fruits, you are going to hear about and, and even other small fruits as well, chilling hours. This is how much code is required to initiate uh, floral bud formation and uh, basically how early in the season they bloom. The bigger the number, the more chilling hours required, the later those trees bloom. That's important because if they bloom too early in spring, a late frost will get them. Uh, and so we do want to look at what's suitable to our area because there are many trees that we might be able to purchase and even, even be able to purchase locally from a source that might be at least borderline, if not flat out, uh, incompatible with our area. So we like resistant varieties. We want them to be suited to our area on chilling hours. We do want to remember resistance is not immunity. There may be one or two diseases that there might be some immunity to, but it's rare. 
But when we have resistance, it means the impact from the disease will be less. And it also means if we're also utilizing a spray program, we're going to get even better control than just a spray program alone. No spray program is perfect, but we're wanting to reduce the impact and resistance is the same way. It doesn't mean we can't have disease, but the overall impact is going to be less, which means better harvesting growth for us. We will say that there are many varieties, both modern as well as heirloom, that do have resistant qualities. And certainly when we're talking about grafted trees, the rootstock that we purchase, the rootstock that we put them on can lend either resistance or maybe susceptibility, depending on our choice. So for instance, there are some very good rootstocks that have fire blight resistance, which is one disease we'll mention tonight with apples and pears. Um, so we can get a step ahead by choosing a rootstock that is highly resistant uh, to help uh, convey that to the tree. What's good is we do have a very recent publication on uh, some varieties that we would recommend as those we might caution against. And so it's kind of like a stoplight or traffic light system in this publication. Green means you're good to go. Yellow means it probably needs a little bit more experienced grower. And red would be this is going to be the hardest to do in our area. So you're going to want to have the most experience uh, before you tackle those varieties. And so you will find for both apples and pears, those recommended varieties, as well as those we might give caution. Um, and I will say sometimes some of the ones we hear that people want to grow are on the caution list for, so Honeycrisp, for instance, is one that sometimes people like to grow. And I know I have personally seen it for sale uh, within the region at like big box stores and things like that. It is not an apple I would recommend anybody in our area grow. It wasn't developed for our area. Even in the areas where Honeycrisp is adapted to grow, professional growers, commercial growers do not like to grow it. It's a very finicky, hard apple to grow. You have to be careful about overbearing, uh, and then the next year you'd be underbearing. So it's a challenge to grow successfully, even for commercial orchards. It's not uncommon if you look through commercial industry um, publications like uh, newspapers and things, fruit grower publications, you can actually find articles where a grower will say, I wouldn't grow it except my buyer requires me to do it because it has such marketability because it is so popular with consumers. So just understand that the easiest and best pest control strategy you have is to pick something that has disease resistance. So when we start, we want to pick the most disease resistant possible. I've already mentioned this some. Generally, when it comes to chilling hours uh, and that beginning of blooming, we are thought to, in Tennessee, especially our region, to be about 1,400 hours. And so we don't have difficulty getting enough chilling hours. It's generally not a problem. So all things being equal, if we have two varieties, one of them has a lower chilling requirement and the other one greater, the one with the lower blooms first, the one with the later uh, or higher uh, chilling hour requirement blooms later. So this is particularly important for peaches. So peaches, there are a few varieties that have a chance. Uh, and I hate to put it that way, but peaches are not a super reliable crop in our area. There are tremendous, there is tremendous disease pressure, but very frequently spring frosts will kill uh, the fruit crop. They bloom early enough most seasons that they are susceptible to it. Uh, it's the same reason why, by and large, things like apricots and almonds and that all, really all those other stone fruits aren't recommended to grow here either. They just bloom too early. So whenever we're buying peaches, we want to be particularly picky about what the chilling hour requirement is. And we want to choose the largest uh, requirement possible. And so there are some recommendations of varieties of peaches on the additional resources I'm sending you. So take a look at that if it's something you're interested in doing. But do understand that peaches are more difficult to grow successfully in our area. It definitely wouldn't be necessarily the crop we would recommend for a novice grower for their first time. Pruning is critical to production, and particularly with uh, diseases, we can do a good job with pruning, creating better air circulation and sunlight penetration. 
which directly reduces leaf wetness within the canopy. And that means that can help reduce the occurrence of diseases. We also look at uh, directing the energy away from vegetative growth and into fruit production. And probably the one mistake we see in the backyard is folks not pruning enough. So typically it's skipped or very minimal. Uh, I will mention I do have a class coming up on January 30th. We're going to be focusing on tree pruning. So take advantage of that. That's something you're interested in. Fruit thinning is another activity we need to be doing in our orchards that sometimes doesn't get uh, the importance it should. This is where we actually remove some of the immature fruit load to result in fewer but larger mature fruit, as well as making sure that the overall fruit load on the tree isn't taxing. When we do have a severe frost, and I see a typo there, uh, or freeze in the spring and we lose a crop, that's next year, we are very susceptible for having an overly large crop. If we do, that then takes so many resources that it actually results in the following year being a very small crop. And you get into a pattern of biennial bearing where you have a large crop followed by a small crop and it just keeps repeating It's self reinforcing So fruit thinning helps prevent that. If you've ever known someone who had a fruit tree and they had so many fruit on it that branches were breaking, that's a classic case where we should have been fruit thinning weeks and weeks ahead of that uh, because there shouldn't be so much fruit on a tree that it's causing branches to break. So where do we start with a pest control program? Basically, we're going to start early in the season, in the dormant season, actually. So we're going to be spraying things before the trees are blooming. We do have some options for spraying during bloom, and some of those are important. And we'll talk about cover sprays. And so this is when we have fruit on the tree post that bloom period. And then for in a couple instances, there are even post-harvest actions where we may consider spraying for some diseases. So big important thing, we always have to follow the pesticide label. Nothing I say here tonight, nothing you find on the internet trumps that label. It's a legal requirement and you must follow those directions. The other thing to understand about pest control is it is about prevention. Many of our disease control products, such as fungicides, work in a protected manner. I think of them as being a shield. They're in place and they present, prevent a disease from infecting. They aren't curative products in that we don't wait till we see a problem and then we can cure it with something. We're not curing things, we're preventing disease. So prevention is our strategy. Even with insecticides, for instance, uh, some insects that will tunnel into fruit, if you have that insecticide spray on that surface and they take the bite of the apple, they're done. They're already inside the apple. There's no way for you to control it. So even with insecticides, typically prevention is a much more effective strategies to make sure that we're effective with our applications. We look at the timing of our sprays, not on a calendar, but actually on the growth stage of the plant. So warmer or colder springs can make trees bloom earlier or later but we time our sprays based on their development and not the calendar. I will say that the kind of schedule we'll talk about tonight is possibly conservative. It is possible that you might apply things more frequently than the spray program references if allowed by the label. And certainly the rainier the year is, the more likely you are to need more frequent applications. If we have a rain of happening before a spray has dried on the plant, which hopefully we don't, hopefully you've looked ahead, or if we have rainfall totals more than an inch within 24 hours of the spray, we would likely need to reapply that spray because it would be ineffective, it'd be washed away. And I will say that everything we do with pest control, off-season sanitation of removing dead fruit out of the orchard, and depending on the disease, sometimes even the dropped leaves is important. And in some diseases, we won't get control if you don't do the sanitation side of it. 
So to start with, we're going to talk about apples and pears. So <clears throat> there are any number of diseases, but these are some of our most common ones that we see. So apple rust, apple scab, fire blight, sooty blotch, and fly speck. And so we'll talk about each of those briefly. So apple rust. Rusts are really neat with apples because they actually have an alternate host. And we actually have three possibilities of cedar, hawthorn, quince. Any one of those can be that alternate host. So those three hosts will produce spores. You see the uh, cedar uh, actually um, the growth on it in the bottom left. Above it is when it's producing those spores. So it has like this orangey gelatinous mass, these horns that come out of that gall on the cedar tree. And those spores then go and infect the leaves or the fruit, as you see on the right. When the fruit and the leaves that are infected begin to produce those spores, those then go back to the host. So it goes back to cedar in this picture or to hawthorn or to quince. And so it's those alternating hosts. Uh, it's kind of a little bit different compared to a lot of diseases. So we have a few strategies. One of these, uh, we do have rust resistant cultivars and we certainly have cedar in our area. So you can remove cedar, hawthorn and quince trees or plants. But reality is if you removed every cedar tree on your property or even in your neighborhood, those spores would probably still travel sufficient distance from elsewhere simply because it's out there in our region. So I think resistant cultivars is great. There are some good fungicides. So again, to help reinforce that resistance. Uh, this can, you know, reduce the uh, leaf canopy that's there to produce all the carbohydrates that the tree needs for growth and we want in the fruit. So this does have an impact on production. And certainly if we get fruit infections, like you see there, it's definitely damaging our production. Apple scab. Uh, so apple scab is one that we can see both on the leaves and on the fruit. Um, this is one where sanitation, if we see this in our orchard, we want to make sure we do a really good job of getting rid of leaf debris as well as infected fruit and don't let it stay in the orchard because that's going to be a source of next year's disease. Uh, that's the source of inoculum. We do have resistant cultivars and in fact, there is excellent resistance. There are some people that go so far as to say it's near immunity. So apple scab is one that we can deal with with cultivar selection and certainly if we don't have resistance in what we've planted fungicide sprays will definitely help us with this fire blight so fire blight uh, is fairly simple to diagnose you will very often see as on the far right the shepherds crooking or hooking on the branch tips as they die back and you also get those leaves retained on the dead branches. So that is fairly diagnostic. You will see this not only in apple, but also pear, including ornamental pear trees, such as um, uh, the calorie pear family, like Bradford pears. So this is something that we can see on species other than just in our orchard. We do have this brought into the orchard or infecting the tree it can be vectored by pollinators. Uh, the severity of this one very much depends on how rainy and wet it is during the bloom period. Infections typically are through the nectaries and the flowers. And so when we have wetter bloom periods, this is a bacteria and wet and bacteria go together. It helps it move easier, helps it transfer, and it needs wet conditions to survive. So the wetter bloom period we have, the more problems we typically see with fire blight. We do both have resistant cultivars as well as, as root stocks. So we've got good resistant package available to us. We used to be able to have antibiotic sprays. I need to strike that from this slide, but we've actually lost um, the EPA allowance for antibiotic sprays within the uh, home orchard. Uh, so we only have some bactericides such as copper-based products, which aren't bad, uh, they're, they're good bactericides um, if we wanna control this. But again, this is one that it's really easy to get some good resistance from cultivar selection. 
So this last one uh, is not that bad of a disease, or actually it's two separate diseases, but it's sooty blot and fly speck. So those larger uh, areas you see on that fruit where it looks like little black dots all together, that's sooty blotch. And the fly speck are those singular, uh, darker, slightly larger individual spots. This is just superficial. This is not going to decay that fruit. You're not going to taste it if you eat it, but it just doesn't look as good. So this is one that, especially if you do no spray, you're more than likely going to see this. Um, I have seen uh, something that looks very similar even on uh, uh, vegetables occasionally, like winter squash. So I think it can have some alternate host. But one of the big things is sanitation with this one. So making sure uh, diseased fruit, fruit that is dropped at the end of season, fruit that's half eaten by somebody and left there, needs to be removed. Uh, this does have host plants uh, in the small fruit, the brambles. And so we have a lot of wild blackberries and even raspberries around. And so if we have the opportunity to remove those in close proximity, that wouldn't be bad. This is one that when we have good open trees with a lot of air infiltration and sunlight, we have more rapid drying. So pruning is a good control strategy. And if we're using other fungicide products during the summer months, we are probably going to cover this one. We probably won't see this one pop up. But I like to mention it because especially if we're doing a minimal spray program, there are possibilities we could see this. And luckily, it's aesthetically unpleasing, but it's not damaging to that fruit. So what about insects? Some of the main ones we could see are aphids and mites. Scale are very infrequent in the home orchard. Honestly, we see scale typically when we have very aggressive insecticide control programs because there are a lot of predator insects that will control scale. And so sometimes we uh, end up uh, having impact on non-target pests. So we were, we're targeting a certain pest, but we kill other insects as well. And sometimes that can allow scale to flourish uh, when ordinarily they wouldn't be a problem. But it, And there's also plant bugs we can see. And there's other uh, insects that we might uh, come across, um, especially at different times of the season. Not every pest is there in the orchard from beginning to end. So you can see later during the cover period, we have a few more pests down there, things like plum curculio, coddling moth, uh, various plant bugs, aphids again, leaf rollers, and even oriental fruit moth. And so we do have a number of different insects. Um, some of those are more or less damaging. Some are directly attacking the fruit, others uh, the tree in general. So what does a spray program actually look like for apples? So here we have one, some pictures that's kind of showing us the development of the tree. So you see the reference of uh, the different states that are there in the time to spray. So when we are dormant, before we have actual growth occurring, we may have some swelling, but they're not growing. We would see looking at a dormant oil application and we might use copper included if we have a history of fire blight. And so what dormant oils are is they're actually a mineral type oil product. Dormant oils are thicker than horticultural oils that might be used later in the season, but basically they suffocate things. So they do a really good job on overwintering insects that might be present there early in the season. And so it's a great way to get a jump on some of those insects. There are certainly organic formulations of uh, dormant oils available. So if you are looking for organic products, this would be one that you have that option. Copper as well, there are organic formulations. When we start getting growth and move to bud break, where we have half inch long green, and you see that there on the left, or all the way to um, tight cluster on the blooms, which is before they're developed much down in the bottom left, that's when we're going to be looking at our first fungicide application. Captan is going to be the product we recommend, and that's going to be there for scab control. So this is even before we get flowers prominent on that plant, we are looking at controlling scab. So again, if we can plant only scab resistant varieties, we may be able to skip this one and have minimal impact. When we get to the pink stage of flowers, and it's called pink because they look pink, 
Uh, it's right before those blooms start to open. You can see that picture there. Again, we're looking at a fungicide application. Uh, we might look at possibly using a different one than Captan. It's not a bad idea to look at alternating or at least not relying on a single uh, fungicide or insecticide all season long. Uh, that's kind of how we get resistance build up uh, if we only rely on one product. So having uh, an alternate product there is not an, uh, a bad plan at all and it's really useful. Then on that next line, we see malathion and esfenvalerate or permethrin. Those three are all insecticides. And so we want to be careful that we're not spraying any insecticide when those blooms are open. So as long as we're before bloom, we can include a uh, insecticide in this. Uh, that would not be a bad problem. Uh, just understand that, you know, anytime we've got blooms, we don't put out insecticides. And so we want to make sure if we're a little late and things have started to actually be in blossom or in bloom, we just pull that one out of the mix. And so, you know, the frequency of this, we're probably just doing a single application uh, at bud break, for instance, with cap tan, and then maybe a single application at pink, because you're not going to have the time period there to do multiple applications. Most of these products, if you look on the label, they'll probably recommend a spray interval of anywhere from 7 to 14 days for most products. Um, I will say that on the insecticide uh, choices. Malathion is highly effective and good, but there are limitations on how frequently we can apply that. If I remember correctly, we're limited to two applications. One of the challenges is, is there are some products for the orchard that are kind of all in one. They include Captan, they include Malathion, but we're still limited to two applications of that product because it contains Malathion. So while those all in one are useful, they are limited in how quickly or how often we can actually apply those. And so this was where I pulled out a slide that used to be in here talking about streptomycin application during um, the bloom period. We actually typically don't worry about it at the home orchard anyway. If we do have fire blight, we have ways of pruning that out in the dormant season you're not going to lose an apple tree because you have a fire blight infestation one year. It's when we leave them completely uncontrolled and the problem kind of explodes on us that we get a problem that might be damaging uh, to the tree. And so we don't really worry about control. So during bloom, I would say we're certainly not doing um, any sort of insecticides. We're not going to be spraying any streptomycin because we're no longer allowed. We do have the option to look at spraying some fungicides. Uh, that can be a useful tool. There is some research that shows that even exposure to non-insecticides is not great for our pollinators. So this might be a period when we don't apply anything at all. That might be a choice if you're wanting to reduce uh, your chemical usage in the orchard, that would be a good time to do it. So petal fall. That's when we start losing the petals off of those flowers. So you can see that picture there in the upper left-hand corner. When we have most of those removed, uh, we would again look at including uh, an insecticide in there. If I am limited on malathion, if I've already used it, or if I'm burning through my options to use it, then I would look at uh, one of the earlier mentioned uh, products um, other than uh, malathion, such as esfenvalerate or permethrin. And so after we have that petal fall, we do look at those first cover sprays. And so those are important because now we've got fruit present. And so these are important to look at keeping up a regular interval. 10 days is not a bad interval. Again, depending on the weather, we may look at tightening that down some. Uh, and we basically look at doing 10 to 14 days the rest of the season. And what we're trying to do is basically, again, maintain that protection in place, both with our insecticides as well as with our fungicides. Pears, we're a little more limited in what products we can use. So the only disease control products that we actually have labeled for use on home pears are copper and sulfur. Uh, both of those are available with organic options. Um, they're not 
bad fungicide products, for instance. Copper is a better bactericide than fungicide. Um, but compared to some of the more modern chemistries and fungicides, they're not quite as good. Uh, but at the same time, pears are fairly tough customers. They seem to have a little bit better disease resistance. So we do look at basically on the insecticide spray schedule, following what we see for apples. Because we're limited on, on products, we might just be looking at copper pre-bloom uh, for uh, the dormant apple period uh, and also the pre-bloom. So when we're talking about pink, for instance, and then pedophile and cover sprays. One thing to be aware of with copper and with pears, we probably don't want to uh, go past early cover sprays and even those early cover sprays right after pedophile are a question because we can actually cause russeting on pears with copper. So russeting is just when we get that rough texture on a fruit. It doesn't actually prevent us from using the fruit, eating it, but it does give us a perhaps aesthetically unexpected uh, fruit uh, surface there on that outer uh, surface on the peel. So that can happen when we're applying copper after petal fall. So that might be one we want to be cautious with doing if that look is something that's very important to us. So if we go to the stone fruits, these are our peaches, plums, and cherries. Uh, we have a little bit different diseases happening and some similar insects, but also different. So, and, and I do think perhaps diseases is our bigger concern on the stone fruit, but brown rot can be absolutely devastating. Uh, black knot can actually kill a tree if left alone. Uh, and peach leaf curl is a little bit different. On the insect side, you see some of those same that we look at dealing with pre-bloom, such as aphids, mites, and scale. During bloom, again, we're protecting our pollinators. Afterwards, we've got plum curculio, plant buds, aphids, oriental fruit moth, stink bug, peach tree borer, and lesser peach tree borer. These are both moths who larva will attack the trunk uh, and branches of peach trees. And so these can actually kill a tree. So when we do insecticide sprays, we actually do look at hitting those main branches and trunk some to give ourselves some protection. So brown knot is probably the number one uh, disease problem I see in the home peach tree. Um, if we don't actively control for it, you're almost guaranteed to see this. So we do want to start with excellent sanitation. So one of the things that happened in those bottom two pictures, uh, you see a full blown infection there, it's just wiping out the fruit on that tree. And if you just leave it there, it's going to turn into that mummy fruit that you kind of see bottom left there, that dried up dark fruit. Those will be hanging on trees right now. We could probably go find peach trees that have those dead mummy fruit on them. That is extremely important to remove. It's also important if we do have any sort of branch or um, node infestations like you see in the left two pictures there, that while we prune, we remove those and get those out of the orchard. Don't drop them on the ground. Don't let them decompose. We want to trash them or burn them. We want to make sure we're removing as much inoculum or source of that disease as possible. Uh, physical injury will cause this to happen to a greater extent. Uh, so if we can limit insects, we're helping ourselves on brown rot control, even birds. So if we notice we have a lot of birds trying to pick our fruit, maybe looking at doing some netting or things like that to discourage them. We do look at a uh, frequent uh, fungicide application with this one. This is one that we want to maintain um, that fungicide spray basically from bloom through to harvest. Um, we might slack off a little bit in the later period, but uh, definitely early fungicide sprays during bloom are pretty much uh, strongly recommended for this pest. The other thing we can do is if we do have fruit that are making it through, go ahead and refrigerate those at harvest rather than leaving them at room temperature for long periods of time. It'll help them to last longer in case there is some inoculum there. But it's not uncommon that you will see every fruit on a tree with those brown uh, 
sunken lesions like that if, if the tree's not in some sort of spray program. Unfortunately, we don't have resistance, so that's not going to be a good option for us here. But again, this is another one that we can make it worse or better with pruning. So we would want to do a good job with pruning and opening those trees up well. But brown rot is a very common um, disease that we see in the home orchard. Black knot, uh, it can be pretty dramatic and it can kill trees. We have to remove the infection. So what you see there, black knot, the name's pretty descriptive, at least depending how long it's been on the tree, you'll get these black growths. It looks really weird. It can actually encircle a branch or a trunk and girdle it, just cut off the ability for it to move carbohydrates up and down and water up and down. And so when that happens, the limb will die or the tree will die, depending if it's on the trunk. So when left uncontrolled, this will just continue to spread in the tree. So sanitation with basically is to say removing that disease whenever it first infects the tree is critical. You're going to cut six to eight inches below any of that damage you're seeing and you then want to discard that. We're doing this in the dormant season again. So from now till early March would be a good time to do that. When possible, we'd like to remove wild stone fruit species out there. Maybe not always practical, but if we know we have some uh, wild cherry trees or things like that on the property, the more of those that are present, the more likely we are to see this. And so uh, this will, uh, again, infect stone fruit. Uh, and it even affects um, the non-fruit bearing species. So there are a lot of ornamental uh, plum trees, for instance, that are planted in the landscape that you can actually see this infecting. So this is not limited only to our orchards. Um, we certainly can use fungicides to prevent new infections, but fungicides are only effective if we're removing all the knots we see. And so if we leave those knots there, they're going to produce so much disease causing inoculum that we're not going to be able to have a robust enough spray program to deal with it. So you have to remove these knots. You have to remove the physical infections you're seeing and then use the fungicides as a supporting mechanism. So I don't think we can just spray and cure this one. We can't. We have to do a good job with pruning. Peach leaf curl. Uh, can be uh, a uh, interesting disease probably because it causes thickening and curling and even that purpling of leaves. Very unusual. We do have fungicides that we can spray before bud break that will help control this. We are, you know, hopefully getting peach leaf curl resistance whenever we're selecting our cultivars as well. Not super common, but this is one where if we are seeing it in trees, we might be looking at doing a fungicide spray after the leaves have dropped in the fall because we can actually have impact on that organism that time of year and prevent it from overwintering. So this is the one that, you know, even though we may have a tree that's no longer, you know, green and growing, we might still look at doing a control if we've seen this uh, in our trees. So a little bit different, uh, but one that's not too uncommon. We see it from time to time. So what does it look like uh, when we're talking about these spray programs for the stone fruits? When we have that dormant period, again, we're gonna be looking again at horticultural oils, same exact reason. It's great at smothering those overwintering insects. When we actually have that bloom present, we do want to um, utilize a fungicide. So Captan, again, is recommended. It's a good one. I think using sanitation alone to control brown rot is a real challenge in our area. Uh, and so I highly encourage folks, if they're trying to control black rot, excuse me, brown rot, not just rely on um physical means or cultural practices. Sanitation is needed. Again, I don't think fungicide alone is going to do a great job, but if we've done a good job getting out the mummy fruit, getting those out of the orchard, and then we come in with a good spray program, we definitely are getting a, a leg up, I think. 
Uh, if we have black knot on cherry and plum, then we would really look at utilizing uh, a captan spray for sure, because again, we need that spray to supplement good sanitation. Without sanitation, we don't have a chance on black knot. So our cover sprays, when we start having those petals to fall, again, we're looking at fungicide captan or sulfur or chlorothalonil. So the thing to be aware of, not every fruit tree can have the same products used on it. So chlorothalonil, for instance, doesn't have a label available for apples and pears. It's a great fungicide. It actually can be used across much of the horticultural community in our gardens but it doesn't have the allowance on fruit trees, on apples and pears. So we're not gonna be able to use it there, but we can use it on our stone fruits. So that does give us a uh, ability to alternate to chlorothalonil. We can, again, include malathion, but be careful on the frequency we're spraying that because there are limitations to it. Uh, you can see then at shuck split, uh, which is after the petal fall, about a week, we will be looking at again kind of the same process i would encourage you to try to have two fungicides not just rely on one look at alternating those uh, and again um, you have to read specific labels uh, there's a reference here to bonide uh, malathion uh, that doesn't allow use on plum why because it wasn't applied for through the epa so make sure you do read labels carefully on this you will see a uh, carbaryl uh, listed there uh, as an option for the insecticide sprays. Carbaryl is a good product. It's older. It's an organic phosphate. It is what used to be called seven. Seven is now a completely different chemical product, but they kept the name because folks were used to using seven in the garden. We don't use carbaryl on apple trees because it will actually cause uh, fruit thinning. It'll actually cause fruit to drop. And so we wouldn't use it as an insecticide spray on fruit trees. Uh, and so that's why you don't see that listed on those uh, uh, apple and pear trees because it would actually cause something. It actually creates um, a higher level of hormone within the tree, oxen, and it causes that fruit to drop off. So we don't have that problem on stone fruit. So we're able to use it here. So it's one that we also, I'd say it's very good on things like beetles. Um, not that permethrin or malathion aren't, but it certainly is another one that we can use. Um, we do want to be careful with permethrin because it will cause mite problems. It's one that, again, because it's good at killing a broad spectrum of insects, it can kill predators of mites. And so we can actually end up with a situation where we do have a new problem that we created. We also have some other uh, products again um, here. When we have those cover sprays, we do like to include esphenvalerate or, uh, or gamma psi halothrin. Anytime you see the thrin, that's one of the synthetic pyrethroids, and there's a whole group of those, um, but it, they're good chemicals. They work well. The reason we might want to include these specifically goes back to those peach tree borers uh, or the lesser peach tree borer. When we're using these products, if we make a point to uh, make sure we're getting good coverage on the major branches of those stone fruit trees, we're going to be doing ourselves uh, a favor. If you've ever seen stone fruit trees that have a lot of gamosis or, you know, the oozing of the sap and the gummy stuff coming out of uh, their trunks, chances are, it doesn't have to be, but chances are, uh, there's a high likelihood that we have some uh, peach tree borer activity happening. So protecting those trunks, again, with that um, insecticide spray as a protectant uh, so that it gets there before uh, the moth shows up is important. When we look at pre-harvest, we do want to pay attention to when our last spray is before harvest because, for instance, these two insecticide products do have a um, pre-harvest interval of 14 days. Again, when we are getting close to harvest, we do look at what we're using, so we can still use things like Captan. Immunox is another um, disease control product that works well. 
it has good control on some things that CapTam might be a little weak on. We are still doing these up until uh, we are getting basically within a week of harvest because we're trying to protect from brown rot. We don't want to get the crop that close and then have it fail because we didn't keep that protection in place. And again, if we are seeing peach leaf curl and on plums, there's a, a disease that's plum pockets. If we've seen that happening, then we would look at that dormant fall spray of a fungicide product uh, to help control those and prevent those from overwintering. So again, with peaches and apples, some similarities, some common products between the two, but not everything that's labeled for one is labeled for the other. So be aware of that. If you have a mixed orchard, um, you might look at having two sprayers, especially if you allow spray uh, to remain in it uh, in between sprays so you that way you're not having to constantly dump things and remix uh, as you switch between the families there one thing i want to encourage you to take a look at and utilize this season are some fruit scouting resources from the university of kentucky uh, what's great about them is they have great pictures and so it's not just diseases it's not just insects it's all sorts of things that you can see there on that list, such as physiological disorders, wildlife damage, even common weeds you may find. And so this is one that can help you take a look and see what's going on in the orchard. And obviously you can send pictures to me, email them, text them. That works great. Uh, but sometimes this gives you an idea of what to be looking for, what's out of the ordinary. And, and, you know, should you be concerned if you're seeing something, this can give you an idea what to look for. And it can at least be a starting point to think about what might be wrong. So I really like these. I got great pictures. And so I, I think they're useful for us. So with that, uh, we will pause for questions.